Well, fantastic to have Gavin Peacock on Deeper Into the Word. Gavin is well known to a lot of you for his playing days in QPR, Newcastle and Chelsea, as well as other teams. And for some of you younger fears, you will possibly know him as a pundit on Match of a Day and Football Focus. Gavin has over 500 uh, 500 appearances and over 100 goals as an attacking midfielder and currently is serving as a passer in Canada. So Gavin, thank you for joining with us tonight. Real good to be with you, Keith. So Gavin, as a former pundit, give us your thoughts on the England Euro 2020. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I thought it was a, a great performance overall uh, from a, you know, a young uh, talented team. Um, I think we've become a good tournament team now. And then people say we were on the right side of the draw. And well, you, that's true. I think you were on a, a good side of the draw, but you still got to beat what's in front of you. You still got to get out the group stages and then through the knockout stages. And um, good tournament team. And um, yeah, all the way to the final. I thought Italy were the better team uh, on the day and overall the tournament. Uh, a very good team. Um, and, and Gareth Southgate was, came under some criticism for maybe not taking a few more risks going forward, which I can see, you know, um, maybe he needed to bring on uh, Jack Grealish or Foden or both of them a little bit earlier in that match to, to kind of change the momentum. At the same time, um, you know, you, you're playing Italy and actually Italy renowned over the years for being very defensive, quite boring. Even with a plethora of great attacking talent, they remained very cagey and ended up winning tournaments. So it, it was tough and obviously a tough way to go out with, with, the, with the penalty shootout. Um, so overall, I think encouraging because you've, you've got to say that the last two tournaments was the best we've done since 1966 when we won it. You know, semi-final of the World Cup and the final of the Euros. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next World Cup and seeing what we can do in that. Certainly, the prospects are looking pretty good, Gavin. And throughout your career, uh, you sort of were touching the England squad at times. And I was chatting with a couple of friends and I said, the best England team never to get picked for England, where he thought Gavin Peacock would be there, probably centre attacking midfielder. Um, but as we also think about the Euros, Gavin, um, after... Um, there was a lot of uh, talk about the racism that some of the players received. As a player, do you ever come across any of that? Did any of your team come across it? And just what do you, where do you think racism keeps on raising its ugly head, particularly yeah. in football? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a real shame to see any kind of racism in, in any walk of life. Um, of course, nowadays with the social media and uh, it, it, you know, this kind of stuff gets um, broadcast very quickly and uh, it creates uh, anger and uh, a momentum and a Ferrari um, very quickly with, with it. and of course people can post stuff online now in an anonymous way, they are very brave behind a computer screen uh, and say certain things they wouldn't say uh, face to face. It was a shame because it, you know, it was a great performance from the England team and that it's marred by a few, but it's still something that needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, why does it happen? Because, because it happens because of sin, <laughs> because the, you know, the root uh, problem isn't, isn't racism. It's, it's sin in, in the hearts of man. And, uh, and that, uh, that pride that would elevate itself over another because of, uh, the colour of skin, ethnicity, uh, and what have you. Um, so, you know, as uh, as a Christian, um, you know, the, this, w we need to educate people on the, the evil of racism and how you might deal with it. But to get to the heart of it uh, is, is heart change in a person. Uh, and that's what the Christian faith obviously is all about. It's a, it's a new you. It's a heart change. It's treating people created in the image of God uh, respectfully. Um, and that's where you, you'd put it to death. Um, otherwise, you'll get over the years, there'll be 
ebbs and flows and there'll be times where it's bad and times where it's got gets a bit better but it'll always be there to some degree yeah and we're going to get to the hard change that you have um encountered and uh you do talk about it in your new book called a greater glory from pitch to pulpit and really fascinating read and would encourage anybody to get a uh, hold of a copy of it and to share it and uh, but gavin let's rewind and talk about growing up and um, where did your love of football coming from and tell us about just growing up in England. Yeah, I, I grew up in a footballing family. So my dad, Keith, was a professional footballer for Charlton Athletic for 17 years in the 1960s and 70s. In fact, he's the player that played most outfield appearances for Charlton in, in their history. Uh, one club man, um, captain of Charlton and so I grew up around the dr dressing room and and the valley there going down to watch uh, the team and I knew the players so you know I, I, I grew up in a loving home where I had a great mum and dad and, and, and my sister uh, and then the example of my dad um, and the encouragement of my dad helped stoke in my heart a love for the, for the game myself and you know I, I think I was a good player as a, as a youngster, but not the greatest, but a good player. Um, and then I just, you know, developed through the stages. And I think with a combination of some, uh, some talent there, but a real dedication and good character, you know, I was able to sort of uh, come through the ranks to be a promising young schoolboy. I played for England schoolboys when I was 15. Yeah, so obviously you achieved probably a boy who dreamed to represent your country at underage level. Mm. That was obviously after some time in the US that you talk about as well in your book. Again, interesting, something that I didn't realise before reading it. But tell us about then your first club um, appearance and how did that all feel to get signed and then to Maybe. get into the first team squad. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you know, I, I left school at 16, uh, you know, finished my GCSEs and signed for Queen's Park Rangers. I, I chose to sign for Rangers. I had the options of Liverpool and Arsenal, Tottenham, but Rangers were in the top division and um, slightly smaller team as well than those others and a chance of coming through a bit earlier. And Terry Venables was manager, um, obviously young, bright manager. They played on a plastic pitch there, the, the AstroTurf, first AstroTurf pitch in the, in the league. And, uh, but a good reputation for bringing young players through and so I signed um, and of course you know a lot of people think oh once you've signed you've heard, you know you've, you've made it well no that's just be, the hard work's just beginning um, so it was a matter over the next couple of years of of really becoming a professional footballer it's business now uh, you know it's full-time training these you know it's, it's, it's agonizing training it's hard work mentally and physically you're in a man's world and um, and it's cutthroat to, to, uh, to a great degree as well. Uh, and so over the next couple of years, it was a matter of playing for the youth team reserves um, and then making my first team debut when Jim Smith had taken over by that time as manager. And he uh, gave me my debut against Sheffield Wednesday uh, just a few days after my 19th birthday. So it was a, it was a great occasion. Wonderful. Well, as a Sheffield Wednesday fan, <laughs> um, that was one of the games that we didn't lose. So um, two, 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 two <laughs> draw at Loftus Road. It was. Oh, very good. Um, so you, at this time, you're young. You've got a promising career ahead of you. You, um, you learned on something pretty peculiar, and mm -hmm. you started to investigate Christianity, and you became a Christian. Tell us about that journey, Gavin, and what yeah. sort of began that within you? Hmm. Well, I, I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. Um, as I say, it was a stable, loving home, but not a Christian home. Um, and uh, football was my God. You know, all I ever, ever wanted to do was play football, follow my dad's footsteps. I achieved that schoolboy dream. And, uh, and yet, when I got the schoolboy dream, because football was my God, if I played well, I was up. If I played bad, I was down. So in those first couple of years as a as signed as a pro, I, I was a bit up and down and thinking, oh, this is what the world says. This will bring happiness, you know, this kind of career. You know, you've got 
the, the, the great career, you've got a little bit of money, you've got fame growing. Um, this should bring ultimate satisfaction, but it wasn't quite. So that was going around in my mind. And I lived at home at the time. And then just one night, my mum said uh, she was going to go along to the local church. As I say, not a Christian, but she just checked it out. It's a local Methodist church. So I said, I'll keep her company. And afterwards, the minister invited me back to his house where there was a, a youth meeting, only about half a dozen young people my age there. And I, I pulled up to that meeting. I was driving a Ford Escort XR3i. It was a proper 1980s sports car. I, as I said, I've got, I'm in the in crowd. I've got a little bit of money. I've got the career. These people didn't have what I had. But when they spoke about Jesus Christ and when they prayed, there was a joy and reality they had that I did not have. And then I heard over the next couple of weeks, the minister unpacked from the Bible, uh, what is the gospel? In other words, what is the good news of, of what God has done to save uh, people like me and you and uh, in the life, death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And, and I realized, you know, that, that God had created me, that I had uh, sinned against this, this, this holy and loving God. Um, and that because he was holy, he was to judge my sin. And I sat under his judgment. Uh, and yet through his great grace, he sent his son to be a sacrifice for my sins. And, um, and I realized that, that my greatest need wasn't the approval of the crowd on Saturday, but to be in a right relationship with the living God. And that was possible through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and I believed, uh, and then my whole, um, my whole life changed. You know, I knew my sins were forgiven. I knew I was a child of God. I had identity and purpose. Jesus was God, not football anymore as such. Um, and yet I was able to enjoy football for what it was. I was a Christian first, but God had put me in the, in the field, as it were, of professional football for a time. Um, and uh, yeah, and my life changed uh, instantly. And then I, there was that joy, there was that sense of satisfaction, that sense of peace that wasn't there uh, before. And at 18 years old, I was a Christian in the world of professional football. And how did the lads in the changing room react to it? Or how did the player or to the fans in the crowd react, Gavin? Well, the players, you know, I, I was honest with the lads. You live with them for 10 months of the year as well. You know, they find out what you do at the weekend. I told them I was a Christian. And there was a mix, I think, of a little bit of Mickey taking. It's something new, you know, in, a, in the professional football camp. If you if you wear a new tie into, into on a match day, it could be, uh, you could find it cut up into pieces afterwards if the lads see it. Anything new is uh, is just fair game for a bit of Mickey taking, but after a while, I think they just began to respect my beliefs and saw that there was a maybe some kind of walk that backed up the talk. and And then I had amazing conversations with players over the years, players you'd never think would ask. Um, so I think it's you know it, it was that combination, and, and and I think people will face that in most walks of life, whatever they do when they say that they are a Christian. Um, and, I, I, and I think that's where our, obviously our, our speech, our, our presentation as Christians of, of what the gospel is, is key. And also our lives and witness to back that up. Um, and you just don't know the effect that you're going to have on people. Yeah, and I'm sure that'll be a real encouragement to people in the world of sport, whether it's uh, amateur, professional, or mm. just social, um, to to do uh, the uh, good words, but also uh, to answer with their our lives as well. And obviously Christians in sport who you were involved with are really keen to help people in the world of sport to do that. Yes. It's clear, God, having read um, A Greater Glory, I go on Kindle, um, <laughs> but it's also available on hardback, I believe, um, that you're, a real family, a, a real family man as well. Tell us how you met your wife and just how your Christian faith and uh, has impact in that sphere of your life as well. Yeah, um, I I met my wife actually. Uh, it would be not long before that first team debut um, when I was uh, a QPR. I was actually uh, at night school studying history A level. 
uh, in southeast London and my wife was in that class and we got talking at the, at the first break on the evening and um, she asked me what I did and I thought well I've got the ideal chat up line here you know that I'm a professional footballer I must get the girl and uh, I told her I was and she said oh I don't really like football at all so God was humbling me um, but she was very interested when we carried on talking I told her I was a Christian and she started to then come to church with me to that youth group and then she, not long after she became a Christian and a couple of years later we we were married um, and uh, yeah I mean obviously Amanda asking Amanda to marry me was the best decision I ever made after following Jesus Christ and I think you know that um, uh, being a Christian shapes the way that uh, I view the family um, that the, the family is instituted and ordained by God from the first pages of scripture where he creates the man and the woman and brings them together in a marriage and says be fruitful and multiply and have children in this one flesh union and also then how uh the the husband me as a husband is is called to uh lead my wife with a sacrificial protective and providing uh example uh and jesus christ himself is is called the bridegroom of 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 the church his bride and so he is sets the example even of of how to be a husband to the bride in the way that he deals with the church and so uh my christian faith then has just shaped completely my family life and um and i've had with two children and uh jake and uh and ava now they're both married but they uh they're both christians as well and they married christian spouses so um yeah we feel very blessed our marriage is now 30 over 30 years old and uh we're still pressing on and and the great thing about christian marriage is that you know you're always growing you're always going somewhere it's not a case of flattening it's uh, or getting stale it's a case of growing in your walk as a christian husband christian wife together in this one flesh union that ephesians 5 says is a picture of christ and the church yeah thanks gavin get back to the football and um after a few clubs you end up at newcastle and uh, playing on their Kevin Keegan, a team that you supported as a child, and uh, your grandfather um, was just delighted that you uh, signed for Newcastle. Um, again, a fascinating couple of chapters in the book. Tell us about playing for Kevin Keegan, mm -hmm. I'm a real resident, um, and tell us about your time at the club in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim Smith had gone to, taken over at Newcastle uh, after I'd left QPR and gone on my travels a little bit. I was with Harry Redknapp at Bournemouth and Jim Smith bought me from Bournemouth, took me up to Newcastle. And it was just, as soon as I arrived there, you know, it, it was a twofold thing. I, I knew I was arriving at a sleeping giant, big club. Uh, and it was a club that, as you say, I'd supported as a kid. Uh, obviously I was a Charlton fan because of my dad, but my granddad and, and grandmother, they were from South Shields. So they were Geordies born and bred. And first ever kit I got was even before a Charlton kit was a Newcastle kit. I used to go there for family holidays. And, and so signing for Newcastle was a dream for my granddad, you know, that I would pull on that famous black and white shirt. Um, and then after playing for Jim for a little while, Ozzy Ardiles took over. I had some time with that, the great Argentinian. Uh, and he really helped my game in terms of attacking midfield. And then Keegan came in and he was like a breath of fresh air inspirational man, inspirational manager, knew how to make you different players tick just to say the right thing. And he made you believe that you could, you know, we would get promotion to the Premier League. He just made you believe. He bought good players, but he put us together in this unit as a team. And it was uh, some of the best football I've ever played with any of the teams, and that's included Chelsea, um, when we got promotion to the Premier League. And so, yeah, uh, I tell quite a few stories through all the clubs I played for, but uh, of the Newcastle days and, and some of the stories of what made Kevin Keegan such a great leader. In fact, my book is in some ways a, uh, a study of leadership. You know, the, the great leaders I played for, I was a captain and a leader at my teams and just what it takes to 
to be a great leader is, is one of the threads along with family and all of these other things that, that the book contains. No, it really has. And we'll talk about Glenn Hoddle at Chelsea, Will, um, and even in the BBC. I mean, you, you serve and you work under some great leaders there as well. And also Captain QPR, Newcastle and uh, Chelsea. So we'll touch on that just uh, later on in our interview. Um, you've just won promotion to the first division and uh, current premiership with Newcastle. And then you and Amanda are expecting your first child. And mm. things like a bit of a twist. How did uh, what happened? How are you coping? How are your Christian faith again impact what was going on in those days? Yeah, I, uh, we got promotion to the Premier League and Amanda was uh, just about to give birth to our first child, Jake. It was a very difficult uh, labour. And uh, two days later, Jake was born, forceps delivery, cord wrapped around his neck. He'd been sort of fighting for his life. And then we discovered as well that he had uh, only one hand. So Jake has only a third of his forearm below the elbow. And it was a total shock. We only had one scan in those days, amazingly. And the way he was lying, I think it must have been, just didn't show up on the scan on that day. Um, and so you can imagine being the highest you've ever been, uh, then to just be in this, you know, the, the, your, your stomach is, is turned over, you're, you're reeling from the shock in those days. You know, we didn't know so much about limb deficiencies. Um, there were other things often attached to a limb deficiency like brain or heart or lung issues. So there was a series of tests going on. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, at moments of crisis, you really find out what you stand on. Uh, what is your rock? And, you know, Christ is our rock and was our rock. And then, and, um, you know, th through... The, the words of uh, encouragement of friends around through prayer, through the, the reading of our Bibles, that we were, uh, we could be assured that we didn't have all the answers and know why this happened or completely why this happened. But we know that, knew that the God who was in control of all things was good and loving and uh, cared for us. And he'd shown that in sending his son to die for us and rise again. And, and so we could rest in that, in that hope and in that security. Um, and so that's very much how our Christian place have sustained us in those days. And it's amazing to read in your book again, just what your son's gone on to achieve and, and his, is it Muay Thai boxing? Muay Thai, yeah, yeah. Um, Muay Thai is a professional Muay Thai fighter in a sport you think you need two hands for in fact Muay Thai is called the art of eight limbs uh, and yet he has one hand missing but he's a pro he's just won the uh, the North American title he's uh, he's fighting in Glasgow uh, next month actually uh, 20th of August I believe uh, and that will be for a European title and he runs his own gym in Calgary but most of all he's and best of all he's uh, he loves the Lord and and he's a Christian lad. So uh, yeah, it's amazing how God has worked in his life and shown him grace and shown that, you know, I think he's an inspirational story anyway, as to perseverance against the odds. Um, and, uh, and he can talk to many people as well and give that perspective about how before he was a Christian even, he's, he had struggled a little bit with body image stuff, you know, because of his hand and people would look and, uh, but now, as a Christian, his identity is is not in his body. It's not in being a professional fighter. It's in Jesus Christ, and uh, and those other things come afterwards. So it's a good testimony. Yeah, absolutely. How did what happened to Jake then affect your career on the pitch, Gavin? Well, I Kevin Keegan was brilliant at the time. It was traumatic. He was calling me up, concerned for me, my wife baby and uh and after a little bit of time we we were london people london folks we, i think at some stage we'd have already re always returned to london but I think we wanted to get back down to be close to the family and i expressed this to kevin 
and he was excellent. He said, look, I don't want you to leave. I'm bringing Beardsley in and you and Beardsley, Andy Cole would go well together. Um, he said, but if your wife's not happy, you won't play your best football. So I won't outprice you in the market. And within a couple of months, uh, Glenn Hoddle had got the uh, Chelsea job. Uh, he'd been Swindon manager, got them to the Premier League, got the Chelsea job. And Glenn, who'd been interested in me from his diet days at Swindon, uh, he called me up and said, I'd like to make you my first uh, signing for Chelsea Football Club. And then it was a no-brainer for me. Sad to leave Newcastle and in those circumstances, because I loved it so much there. And I loved the fans and I would have stayed. Uh, but uh, just timing in life is, is everything. And it was the right time for me to go and to join a very big club in London on the cusp of a real turnaround with, with a great manager. Yeah. And tell us about Chelsea before the days of Abramovich. And yeah. tell us, I mean, Glenn Hoddle, was he as good as they all say he yeah. was? Yeah, been better. He, Keegan called me up after I signed from Chelsea and he said, look, you're going to an equally as big a club. Uh, he said, but uh, he said, you'll learn more from playing with Glenn Hoddle in training than anything else. And by the, and Glenn was only 36. He was in his last year of playing. So he was player manager. So, yeah, Glenn was a genius. Of all the players I've played with, I, I put him down as the best. And I've played with Hullet, Ruth Hullet and Zola and Viali, Di Matteo, all of these uh, excellent players. But Glenn's mind was on a level that, he just saw stuff on the field that no one else saw. And he could deliver passes, left foot, right foot, inside, outside the foot, uh, with just the perfect weight. I mean, if he, it's been said before, if he'd been Brazilian or French or Spanish, he would have had 150 caps for, the, for his country because they would have just built the team around him. Um, so, yeah, playing with Glenn was a real education on the field. And... Uh, yeah, he made me a better player in the four years, three and a half years I was at Chelsea. So playing at Chelsea, probably your highlight of the season was it 93, the FA Cup final? 94, yeah, 94. 94. And the year you scored against Man U, home and away. Yeah. Uh, for everybody out there who hates Man U, <laughs> it's better than, although for all the, the Man U fans will say, well, we got the big one that year where you yeah. came within an inch possibly yeah of great FA Cup final goal mm. tell us about just that experience even right so we yeah, we got to the first FA Cup final in 24 years for Chelsea uh, we we won on a great run I in the FA Cup I scored in every round plus it was Man United in the final and you're right I, I'd scored twice against them in one nil victories during the season. So we did the double over them that season. And even though they were the better team, clearly they'd won the Premier League, we felt we were a bit of their bogey team. And we started the game well. Um, it was a rainy day at Wembley, 90,000 in the stadium. And we were buzzing. And um, yeah, the ball dropped to me about 25 yards out. and I just instinctively flicked it from my right foot to my left. And let fly, and I didn't. I didn't even feel the ball come off my left foot. It was that good a strike. Um, and then it was like, and I, I mean, the first chapter of my book, Greater Glory, is I write about the FA Cup final. It's a whole chapter on that, and it's in the present tense. So I want to draw people into the experience. And yeah, it was as if I, I write it was as if time stands still, you know. And I'm watching this ball fly, and it's going over the head of Peter Schmeichel and he's backpedaling and I'm thinking, this is in, you know, this is in. Peacock scores again, 1-0 to Chelsea. Man United, they're going to think it's not their year. We'll have one, you know, we'll go in one hand on the cup at half time. And, uh, and as he stretched and dived uh, and I'm just looking, it just hit that crossbar and bounced out. And, uh, and we went in 0-0 at half time. And, Second half was a different story. A couple of penalties against us, and they, they then we started to try and go for it, and they hit us on the break. They won four 0 But it's just a inches is the fine line between you know uh, victory and defeat, between success and failure. And uh, three years later, 
Roberto Di Matteo in the FA Cup final, Chelsea play Middlesbrough, burst through in the first minute of the game, hits a stunning shot, hits the same crossbar I hit, this time it's an inch lower and hit the underside of that crossbar and it goes in and Chelsea win their first, uh, go on to win their first silverware and the many silver, uh, silverware to come uh, through that, just an inch lower. But uh, that was part of the turning point, that first season at Chelsea, we're in the cup final, we, we went on to play in Europe the next year, semi-final of Europe, semi-final of the FA Cup the next year and big, bigger players were coming our way as well. Yeah, and you talk about that, this sort of signing Di Matteo for Ali Sola, uh, Hewlett, uh, playing alongside you, then becomes the manager. Things either out at Chelsea, um, and you find your way back to QPR, and you find yourself captaining in QPR. Hmm. Do you enjoy being a captain at Chelsea, hmm. Newcastle, QPR, and what do you learn from these experiences? Yeah, being captain was one of the great privileges of my career and all the teams I played for. Um, and, uh, you know, I loved leading the guys, men out into the into the arena. Um, and I think, you know, to be a captain, you don't have to be the best player. Um, I think you have to be one of the better players, but you, you don't have to be the best, but you have to be able to inspire those around you with your words, with your example, uh, with your character. Um, and some captains are more verbal than others. Um, but uh, I think I grew in that role as well. Kevin Keegan said to me, and again, I write about this in, in the book, Little Insights, you know, Keegan said to me, when you're a captain, you have to give even more of yourself to the team than any uh, of the other teammates. And I thought, oh, that's a lot because it's enough just to keep your own game together, let, let alone give even more of yourself uh, to the team. Um, but I began to grow in that, I think, as I grew as a captain and grew in wisdom, really, in, in dealing with other players and, and seeing the bigger picture. Um, and so, yeah, as my dad had been a captain, I was a captain and, and leader of men on the field. And I, I learned from the great leaders that I... I played under as well, uh, how to be a, a good leader on the field. Yeah, and I think you probably brought some of those lessons off the field as well, even into your church where you mm. pastor, mm. leader of a church, and we'll come on to that. But as we sort of look back on your on the pitch years, what advice would you give to a young sports person watching um, or listening here? either somebody who is a Christian or somebody who is not Christian as they are just engulfed in this love of, of sport, whether it's football, rugby, hockey, whatever mm -hmm. it is, what advice would you give to them sort of reflecting on your own career? Well, I, I mean, you know, to, you know, the, the great thing is that if you love the sport, that's great. You know, you want to play sport for, for the love of the game, not for money. Um, if you're good, money might come along and with success and, and the fame. Uh, but but do it for for the love of the game and uh, and to be to succeed at the top level, very very few do. You have to be realistic in that. Very few do. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that you can't try. And uh, um, it takes a lot of sacrifice, a lot of hard work and dedication. Um, it takes talent, but more than talent, talent it takes character uh, and resilience and. Uh, those are the things that will be tested out if you, if and when you progress through the, the different ranks. Um, but, but for me, and really, you know, one of the messages of, of my book is that, you know, football or, or, or sport is great, but Jesus is greater um, because he is there beyond sport. We're all ex-sportsmen at some, or sportswomen at some stage of life. And, uh, you know, I can't play football now at a professional level. Um, but I'm still a Christian. Christ is still with me. I know where I'm going in, in life, in, in, in the sense of my spiritual life and, and beyond. And that's the greater glory that things like sport echo, uh, you know, that, that wanting some, to praise something that's thrilling and beautiful and excellent, wanting to do it together in a group, a sense of identity, a sense of glory and victory. Um, is all an echo of what we were made for and made to find in in the Lord, um, and that uh, 
that's for me is, is what I would point people to. Um, and, and I just say one other thing to young sports men or women is, is to, is to be listening to the advice of your parents and of your coaches um, because they've walked the path a little bit longer than you. And anyone that I knew know that makes a success in sport has been a learner, you know, and, and has responded well to those who are older and wiser. No, thanks for that, Gavin. Um, you're playing Days come to an end after over 500 appearances and 100 plus goals. You're clearly an intelligent player playing sort of midfield behind the front two. Do you ever consider coaching? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, my dad went into management, was a coach. Uh, Jerry Francis was my manager at uh, QPR for a while and uh, I loved playing for Jerry. Um, in fact, I always say if Jerry had continued at QPR and my playing days had come to an end as they did there and Jerry had said, look, come on board with me, you know, be an assistant coach or player assistant or something. I actually think I might have gone down that route because I had such respect for Jerry. Um, but that wasn't the case. Jerry had left. Ian Holloway had taken over and he was a young manager. Uh, and so I considered it. I was advised by Jerry as well, Jerry Francis, to go take your coaching badges. You'll be good. You know, you've led men as captain. You'll be a good manager. And, and yet the media stuff started to come my way uh, as soon as I decided to retire. And so I thought, I'll just test this out. And it actually went better than I could imagine. I ended up starting again in a new career, um, but ended up working for the BBC and making it onto their kind of elite team for match of the day, football focus, final score, ended up going to Euros in, uh, in Portugal and Switzerland, Austria, and, and to World Cup in Germany. So um, it was a thrilling second career, a dream second career, really, uh, that I really loved doing for the six years that I did it. Yeah, and you talked alongside Hansen, Linegar, Shearer, Lawrence, and all the greats of... UK broadcasting um, but you then took a diversion after those six years into a less familiar path for a former pro um, what led you down this particular path and what was it? Well I mean I, I went into stu studying for church ministry and into the ministry after that um, what led to it was obviously I've been a Christian since I was 18, um, but I'd never really had a, a sense of a call to church ministry or leadership um, until around about 2006, the World Cup in Germany. So my career and second career is on the on the rise. I, I was literally I'm turning down work. I'm starting to present other things. I was presenting songs of praise. I was doing they were sort of getting me at the BBC ready to do other roles uh, as such. Um, so my career was on, on the up. And then my wife, Amanda, got quite ill and she was in hospital for a, a while there and suffering often recalibrates your focus. And I was just spending a lot of time reading the Bible and praying and um, I read a portion of the Bible in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul speaks about preaching the word for the sake of the future of Christianity. And, the great charge that this is and I thought wow that is a that's a great responsibility and something in me stirred you know uh you know I had I did like to that feeling of leading men when I was a, uh, a player and I, I could communicate quite well because obviously I was in on the BBC and and such and um but that didn't qualify me to be a pastor um you know the bible has specific qualifications there that you must meet um, but I thought well what about if I started some sort of studies uh, in the Old Testament New Testament spoke to my church leadership they recognized certain gifts in me they said yeah go for the studies we'll give you some opportunities to maybe do some preaching meanwhile I'm still carrying on at the BBC um, but as I started to do my studies as I started to do some more teaching formally in the church uh, I, it grew in me this desire, this joyful compulsion 
but not only does this bring me joy, but I must do it, a sense of I must do it. Um, and then I decided, I said to my wife, I think I'm going to give it up, give up the second dream career to, to take some time to finish my studies and prepare for church ministry. And in 2008, um, I did. I spoke to the head of BBC Sport and they were quite shocked. Uh, I knew people would be surprised and maybe not quite understand it. I could have studied in England, but we'd been coming to Canada quite regularly. And I thought, what would it look like to go to anonymity? My profile was really high in the UK. People might confuse Gavin Peacock, the footballer, or BBC pundit with Gavin Peacock, the Christian. And I'll come here, finish my master's degree, and then we'll, we'll go back. Uh, be a good experience for the kids. Um, and it'd be a test of our faith. And, and so in 2008, we left the shores of the UK and ended up in Calgary, Alberta, Western Canada, Rocky Mountains Territory. Uh, I finished my studies here in 2011, was looking to go back to England, and I got offered a position as an associate pastor here at Calvary Grace Church in Calgary, where I'm serving now. And, uh, and, and God's opened up the doors for me to go and speak globally. I come back to the UK when invited by different churches, probably at least five, six weeks a year, and other parts of the world as well. And do the Canadians call it soccer? They call it soccer. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. But, and of course, soccer is just not even for place on the sporting agenda here. I mean, it's all about hockey. And then it will be the American sports, big American sports after that. Um, so I do miss my uh, soccer chat and banter that I had back in the UK. But, uh, but no, it's been a very difficult uh, last decade, but a very rewarding one. Yeah. Final couple of questions, Gavin. Really appreciate your time this evening. How would you compare preaching to playing or even preparing to preach to preparing to play from walking out in front of 60,000 a little traffic to walking out in front of, I don't know what your church is, is a couple of hundred? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's, you know, there are differences. I mean, obviously, like the you know, similarities, it's hard work preparing to preach, it's hard work preparing to play. Um, you know, the, that sort of uh, sense of responsibility, I think, is there when you walk out to preach as well as you walk out to, to, to play, to, to, to actually, you know, be a person of integrity and, you know, the, the fans have paid your wages and you want to give good value. As a pastor, um, you want to be a man of integrity and give the people the Bible, the word of God, not your own ideas. Uh, for their good, for, for God's glory. But the difference is that um, the play in football is for a, a glory that's temporary, um, but preaching the gospel is for a glory that's eternal. And that uh, on a Sunday when I'm preaching to 200, I'm dealing with people's souls. Uh, I'm dealing with them through the word of God and in general pastoral life in the high moments of their lives and the low moments of their lives, walking through them as a, to help shepherd them along the way uh, at the same time as I'm walking the Christian life. And so it's not the glamorous thing that football is, but it's, uh, it is a very glorious thing. It's a very uh, rewarding thing. Uh, and and uh, it's the great privilege and the greatest privilege I think that I've had is, is to be a pastor for as long as, that will last. Thanks, Colin. And yeah, as I say, I really appreciate your time. And for anybody who wants to find out more, do grab yourself a copy of Our Greater Glory. You can download it from Kindle right now, or you can purchase it from the Evansdale Bookshop here in Belfast, or any good Christian bookshop, I'm sure they'll have it. But as we conclude, Gavin, how many people who've been watching or listening possibly of football, possibly Chelsea, Newcastle, QPR, but possibly see Jesus as just irrelevant to them. What would you say to them at the end of this interview tonight? Well, um, I think that my book is a story of, uh, of life in all of its complexity, set against the backdrop of the beautiful game of football, but with the light of my Christian faith um, upon it. And... Uh, and so what I hope is that there'll be 
things that people can see during during the book that they'll relate to and love football and everything but points that them gently towards jesus christ as not irrelevant but totally relevant and um even some of the echoes of what they've been looking for in their lives apart from jesus is actually only truly fulfilled in jesus uh that we were made by god for him and jesus shows us that that we need to be reconciled to god in a right relationship with god and jesus is the one that can provide that that we live uh this life now but jesus provides eternal life uh now and and to come and so i would say in it all um the greater glory in life the greater happiness the greater peace the satisfaction that everyone wants is only found in jesus and you know if you think after it all reading my book or what have you that it's irrelevant why not investigate jesus own claims uh, for himself and read uh, the gospel of mark which is very it's the shortest of the gospels the first eight chapters tell you who jesus is the second eight chapters tell you what he came to do and sit down and read the claims of jesus for himself and 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 then decide uh without just uh, discarding him and uh, you know i'm somebody that's had everything the world says will make you happy and i played with some of the greatest talents of a generation uh, and seeing how that doesn't ultimately satisfy um, the great need in us all, uh, but only Jesus can. Gavin, a big thank you for all that you've shared, and thank you for everything you shared in your book as well. Thank you even for what you wrote in your earlier book, You'll Never Walk Alone, having read it as, I think, as a teenager in the world of sport in the Port of Rugby, found very encouraging. And just pray that God will continue to bless you in your in Calvary Church there and your family as well and all that you do in your traveling. So thank you. Uh, Thanks, Keith. Thank you very much.